Next, we're going to talk about developmental disorders, and the DSM-5 categorizes these separately from the kind of more adult level disorders that uh, we talked about previously, uh, otherwise known as kind of the major mental disorders. Uh, and so there's two major ones here, ADHD and autism that we'll talk about. So ADHD is widely known. Uh, again, most people have heard of it. It involves uh, an attention deficit component, so an inability to focus attention over time. Uh, this especially shows up in the school environment where, you know, kids are sitting in class and having to uh, be uh, focusing their attention on a particular subject for an extended period of time. Uh, and then likewise, hyperactivity is a kind of need for constant movement and fidgeting and also kind of problematic in the school environment. And one kind of question about ADHD in general is, is, you know, is, is the kind of rise and prevalence of ADHD in modern societies kind of more of a consequence of this very unnatural uh, kind of environment that we have in the school setting, uh, whereas people who, you know, didn't have to sit in school for long periods of time would be, you know, quote unquote, perfectly normal. Another component of ADHD is also the impulsivity. So hasty decision-making, uh, not kind of taking time to think through the consequences of your actions. And one of the most surprising and controversial aspects of ADHD is the fact that it's treated very successfully, typically, with uh, stimulants. And it's kind of counterintuitive, right? It's like, uh, okay, so you're just kind of hyperactive and now you're gonna give people stimulants? Uh, that doesn't sound right. Um, and that very fact kind of indicates that we don't really understand exactly how these systems work. More recently, Nora Volkow, who's now the director of one of the institutes at the NIH, has a theory that basically ADHD is, is really a deficit in motivational factors. And uh, an earlier hypothesis was that ADHD is really something to do with kind of dis-executive syndrome, kind of a lack of... Uh, function in the overall kind of executive control systems in the frontal cortex, but that doesn't really seem to hold up that well. If you actually sit the, uh, a person with ADHD down and have them do various kinds of cognitive tasks that require that kind of executive control system, they actually do pretty well uh, on average, generally speaking. Uh, what you do see, though, is an increased amount of variability. Sometimes they're engaged and they're doing well. And typically when you put people in a kind of lab context for a short period of time to do these studies, yeah, they can kind of step up and do it. But what really manifests is kind of this longer term kind of motivational engagement uh, issue of are you motivated to really sort of stay engaged? So Volkow summarizes it as saying uh, that it provides their studies provide evidence that there's a disruption in the dopamine reward pathway that's associated with motivational deficits, uh, which may contribute to attentional deficits and supports the use of therapeutic inventions to enhance motivation. And so now when you start thinking about that, it's actually like people are basically bored <laughs> um, in ADHD. And so they're restless and fidgeting and unable to pay attention because they're just not motivated to be engaged in whatever it is that's going on. And that kind of puts things in a very different light, right? So it's not like there's not a capacity to engage. It's just a lack of, you know, basically uh, motivation to do so. Uh, here's the data that Volkow is referring to. So there's this relationship between dopamine and motivation levels. This is looking at the dopamine receptors. And so you can see here a, a nice strong relationship between these dopamine factors in the ventral striatum uh, D2 and dopamine transporter associated with kind of overall uh, indices of motivation. Um, yeah, so looking at things through a different lens here, the motivational lens may provide a better explanation that makes sense of why stimulants are actually useful. There's still plenty of basis for controversy and uh, debate about, you know, is it good to be giving these, you know, often fairly young kids uh, under 10 years old uh, these kind of, you know, things that we otherwise consider to be kind of addictive drugs. I think that makes a lot of people uncomfortable and uh, just trying to have a deeper understanding of what's going on. And maybe there's other ways of making the school environment in particular, where this is really strongly manifest, uh, more motivating in and of itself. If school was more motivating, maybe that would naturally take care of the problem, right? So there's a lot of controversy.
and discussion and room for debate about uh, how best to treat these uh, this situation associated with ADHD. Uh, one of the interesting things and, and another reason why ADHD is considered to be a developmental disorder is just the fact that it does tend to resolve over time. Uh, a smaller percent of people actually maintain this kind of ADHD-like profile into adulthood. The other major uh, widely discussed and well-known uh, disorder associated with developmental disorders is autism. Autism is perhaps the most heterogeneous disorder of any of the disorders we're talking about. The heterogeneity is specifically acknowledged in the name in the DSM-5 category for autism spectrum. It's now specifically considered to be a spectrum disorder. Um, and if you look at all the different kinds of uh, factors uh, that go along with autism in terms of uh, kind of various types of cognitive effects, behavioral effects, uh, medical effects, uh, associated uh, conditions, uh, a large number of different biomarkers, uh, lots of different kind of symptoms, a uh, very wide range of, num of different genetic uh, factors that can contribute to it. It's really a very, very broad kind of uh, catch-all for a lot of different things that kind of have some commonality in terms of, generally speaking, some kind of social, uh, uh, reduced level of social engagement, social function, uh, typically increase in repetitive behavior, uh, insistence on kind of routine uh, more uh, need for kind of controlled, well, well constrained environments. But on the other hand, all of those things are are actually kind of consistent with uh, an inability to deal with the kind of complexity and variability and unpredictability of the social world. And if we go back to the chapter on social and personality, uh, there we we really emphasize this idea that the reason we need to have our kind of big high performing brains is because of the complexity and ambiguity and unpredictability of the social environment that we need big brains to be able to navigate that world. And so if you think about it from that perspective, there's a, a kind of way of thinking about, there's a way of understanding what's happening in autism as kind of like, you know, a really a kind of catch all for lots of different things that make the brain not quite work as well as it normally would in dealing with those kinds of complexities. And so we would actually expect that like social function uh, and ability to deal with kind of novelty and unpredictable things would be the kinds of things that would go kind of first uh, if, if you had some generic impairment in brain function. And so I think it's hard to exclude that I the idea that it may be just a manifestation of lots of different ways in which the brain may not be performing optimally. And it's inconsistent with various attempts over the years to try to provide a very selective, specific explanation of what's happening in autism, such as the theory of mind deficit, or the idea that, that people with autism may be kind of like an extreme male uh, uh, phenotype. Uh, so there is an element of autism, and it's, it's fairly rare, uh, where you have kind of high levels of functioning, uh, and, and you get this kind of extreme focus on a particular kind of domain, uh, subject matter, and actually people achieve very high levels of performance. The very well-known movie Rain Man uh, has really popularized this idea of the kind of autistic savant, uh, but again, that's very rare and, and maybe you know, a very different kind of subtype of autism compared to the much more prevalent type. It may reflect these more widespread impairments. And, you know, on a real world level, most people with autism have a lot of difficulty in kind of daily living. Uh, over 50% have uh, kind of self-harm behavior, often from kind of beating their heads against the wall, literally, you know, this kind of repetitive behaviors that also result in, in kind of self-harm. And so it's really not, uh, again, a kind of glamorous uh, situation for most people. One other interesting clue, again, that's consistent with this idea of kind of a more significant kind of overall impairment is that uh, the uh, MIA, the Maternal Immune in, uh, Activation uh, uh, Etiology, this idea of uh, having an increased amount of immune activation in the, in the mother during development also seems to lead to autism in addition to schizophrenia. And one idea is that the autistic case is actually kind of a more severe version 
And then uh, schizophrenia is, is essentially associated with people who have a more mild uh, level of neural uh, impact. And then that only manifests later, uh, again, in this kind of network of uh, symptoms. Um, so uh, if, it, if it's more severe, it impacts earlier uh, in the developmental time course, and that sort of shows up as autism. So really a lot of open questions and a huge amount of research and a lot of actual progress in treating uh, people with autism and figuring out ways of improving people's uh, quality of lives. But still, it, it, it does a, a significantly impactful uh, developmental disorder. And the third category of major types of disorders defined by the DSM uh, is personality disorder. And personality disorder uh, is somewhat puzzling, as we talked about. It, it um, has this uh, kind of uh, distinction from the other kind of major disorders that is a little bit hard to understand. Uh, it's kind of more associated with social aspects of people's uh, behavior. Some kind of um, challenge to identity uh, some uh, deficits in, in empathy or intimacy, uh, sort of, again, this kind of social dimension uh, and trait-like dimension of the disorder. Uh, and one of the most uh, challenging versions of personality disorder has a very high level of uh, suicide. Uh, people who have borderline personality disorder, uh, the behavior is very kind of moody uh, kind of very unstable, kind of very needy, uh, unstable sense of self, uh, very low self-esteem, uh, very kind of high volatility, stormy relationships. Um, yeah, so very difficult situations uh, for people who have borderline personality disorder and for those in relationships with those people. Um, it's, it's, it's a very challenging situation overall.